All right, testing. We're here. Yes, we are. And the stream is connected. Yes, we are. Beautiful. Hello. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Um, as, uh, so where are we starting? Yes, so we're starting with the basics. Hi, if you're new to the channel, my name is Jose Luis. This is Parametric Camp. We do computational design live streams. We edit videos, we record tutorials, we edit them, we publish them, we make playlists, we make courses, and we have a lot of fun doing this as with people live in the stream as we have right now. Michael, BBVR, Nicolas, Andres, I'd ask you, welcome. Good to see you again. Um, very happy to be here amongst amongst uh, the community. This is all about the community at the end of the day. So as we said before, well, um, boilerplate, where is the boilerplate? Yes. So if you want to know more about what we do, subscribe to the channel. That's uh, probably the best way to, go to do it. Otherwise, you can follow us on social media right over there. And if you want to know when we go live, we have a Google Calendar at, in the description of this video that you can check. Or you can join us on our Discord server where we have conversations offline over the week, we talk about things, people post code questions, um, we have a bonfire because, you know, this parametric camp, you know, so all those things. And as I promise, this is, I'm so happy about this, this is the 100th live stream. And I should have like Daniel Schiffman, some sound effects like -da! fireworks or something, <laughs> which I do not. So um, I guess I should start learning from Twitchers how to do these things. Anyway, uh, as I promised, we had something very special prepared for today and I cannot, I'm so excited about introducing you. So, so what's going on today is that to celebrate the 100th anniversary, not anniversary, the 100th live stream of Parametric Cam, I thought of doing something special and I thought of doing something related to the playlist that we're currently almost finishing recording, which is advanced development in Grasshopper. So I thought it would be a good idea talking about advanced development in Grasshopper to invite people who I consider are very advanced in all things Grasshopper computational design and especially related to the things that we have been learning in the playlist, like um, plugin development, for example invite them over, have a conversation about how they think and how they conceptualize creating tools for other people, to, especially to make them more creative, and then use that video perhaps as a wrap up to the playlist whenever we finish it and just place it as a colophon. I think that's the, that's the technical word, right? So uh, I'm super excited. They're here right now waiting in the, in the backstage. And I'm going to bring them in very soon. And in order to do that, I am going to first test out if things are working. So right now, um, we have everyone on the screen, Andrew, Raja, Andy, Mike. Uh, I just want to do a quick audio check and see. Andrew, can you say hi? Hello. Hello, Raja. Hello, everyone. Uh, beautiful. Andy? Nope, Andy, not working. Mike? Hey, how's it going? Good. Nope, Andy's still not. Ah, damn it. <laughs> How about now? Yeah, now you got it. Yes, beautiful. OK, so everything is working. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide you temporarily. I'm going to officially start the recording of the video that we will do and I'm going to introduce you one by one and then we can start the conversation okay all right so let's let's do this then <clears throat> hello this is Jose Luis again here at parametric camp and welcome to probably the last if not one of the last videos in this playlist, Advanced Development in Grasshopper, where now that we have learned all the technical stuff, like how do you uh, write C-sharp code, how do you understand Rhino Common, how do you do scripting in Grasshopper, and then how do you develop native plugins, I would actually like to take some time now to perhaps have a conversation 
about all the other things that are not technical, but are more conceptual and perhaps even psychological and creative about aspects of creating, developing plugins for other people or creating tools for people to use. And in that sense, for that, I would like to invite to this conversation four people whose work I tremendously admire and I think it's extremely representative about the spirit, the technologies and the ideas of helping other people more create, be more creative. So what I would like to do is, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Andrew Human. Hi, Human. Hi, Andrew. You're on the video right now. Andrew is Hi. a computational designer uh, who has worked in the past at NBBJ, Roots Baggots, and WeWork, and is currently working at Hyper.io as of the recording of this video, correct? And uh, yep. he is probably one of the most prolific Grasshopper plugin developers in this planet right now. He's written Human, <laughs> Human UI, MetaHopper, Shutterbug, Doodlebug, JSON, <laughs> and the list keeps going on. <laughs> and so uh, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate your time. It's great to be here. Awesome. I would like to invite Raja to the stage. Raja is also a computational designer and an educator. She is an adjunct professor at the New School of Architecture and Design in San Diego, also a software developer at McNeil, as of the recording of this video. She has written three core Bibles about everything that we have been learning in this playlist. She's written Essential Mathematics for Computational Design, Essential Algorithms and Data Structures, and Essential Guides to c -sharp Scripting, all tremendously relevant to the things that we have learned here, and free and open source for everyone to check. Thank you so much for that, Raja. And she's also the creator of Paneling Tools, one of the earliest Grasshopper plugins, perhaps, and also one that is extremely popular. It has a lot of downloads on Food for Rhino. I just checked this morning before doing this. So thank you for being here, Raja. I would Bye. like to invite to the stage Andy Payne. Hi, Andy. How are you doing? Andy. Hey. Andy is an architect, computational designer, software developer, and fellow colleague from the GSD as well. He has worked previously at Case, at Autodesk, even you had a thing going on with Tesla at some point, right? And the Proving Ground. And currently also be working as a software developer at McNeil. He is the co-creator of Firefly one of the most popular plugins in the history of Grasshopper and fundamental to anyone who has ever done any kind of human computer interaction or physical computing using Grasshopper as the base. Thank you for being here. Thanks for inviting me. And I would like to welcome Mike Pryor as well. Hi, Mike. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Mike is a computational designer and an architect. He has worked previously as, at Trahan Architects, at Nike, and he is the founder of Design Morphine and the creator of a master's in science in computational and advanced design, correct? Yes. Yeah, awesome. He is currently a, the head of procedural generation at Wilder Worlds, a metaverse company, correct? Yeah. And he's also the creator of Pufferfish one of the most popular and grasshopper plugins as of right now on Food for Rhino for complex geometry generation, shape, form, and a lot of other things. That actually, it's actually quite comprehensive, more than 300 components, I believe, right? Yeah, something, yeah, something like that around there. <laughs> All right, <laughs> beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for accepting my invitation and thank you uh, for sharing some of your insights with the community. Um, so, as I said, this is the end of a playlist where we have learned a lot of the technicals about how to develop uh, Grasshopper plugins, CSR scripting, and doing computational geometry. Um, but I would like perhaps to talk more about uh, what goes into designing a Grasshopper plugin in the first place, or perhaps the more general conversation of when, as designers, as people who create tools for other people, how do we think about that process? So perhaps I would like to start the conversation with uh, the general question of what motivated you folks to write a plugin in the first place and to make that a contribution to the community in the first place. So how did this start 
what is your story behind this? And I might just want to throw Andrew under the bus just because he's the first one on the screen <laughs> right now. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Happy to answer that. Um, so I think my the first plugin that I ever wrote, Human, grew out of some scripts that I had built for myself for my gra- undergraduate architecture thesis. I had just built some stuff for working with like layers and objects in Rhino, and I found myself using them over and over again. And I was kind of interested to learn about the process of building Grasshopper plugins. And so I kind of took the code from those C-sharp script user objects and kind of compiled them together into a plugin and made it available for other people. And then just kind of slowly started growing that over time. Um, And I think a lot of the plugins that I've built have started that way. It's a tool that I built for myself. It was just like serving a need for something I was working on. Um, And then you know, I think human UI grew out of maybe a more specific thing where I was finding that there was sort of a gap in how computation was being used at the firm I was working at at the time, NBBJ, where people were a little scared to adopt Grasshopper. And I wanted to build a little bit of a bridge so that the tools that we were building in Grasshopper could be available to a wider audience. So that one actually grew out of kind of a a real present need among my colleagues. We were trying to sort of figure out how to make make these tools more accessible. Um, And so, you know, kind of started that way. So it it tends to start as a little prototype and then grow into something that we can make available to others. Raja, may I invite you to share your story as well? Yeah, sure. I mean, in my case, since I started with McNeil a very long time ago, I mean, as writing um, maybe before Grasshopper, right? So um, everything we write there is based on um, a problem to solve for a user. So uh, there are these users that are stuck with certain tasks or unable to achieve something. And then how, how about we add some functionality to Rhino to be able to support those people, like uh, dynamic sectioning. So one of the first plugins I wrote, I wrote was, was Section Tools, basically. And this is just the Rhino plugin bit. And um, for paneling as well, and pattern generation in 3D was uh, a, a user problem. And then you start using, you know, working with the users to see if that solved their problem, and it turns into a, a general use, basically, uh, tool. And this is when it becomes a plugin um, that is published and shared with everyone. So I guess very similar to any other um, uh, person here in in, in the panel is. Um, always start with with a problem that need to be solved. And then uh, if the plugin facilitate that, then it is most likely gonna be successful and might be used. Uh, that's kind of in, in general, what motivates developing plugins, yeah. Mm-hmm. Andy, how about you? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, I find myself a little bit uh, in the vein of Andrew and Raja in that um, it's always search for the problem for me. I also find it interesting that you frame the problem, Jose, in that um, the question is about developing plugins for other users, because for me, it's usually a, a pretty personal uh, quest that I'm on. To I have an idea that I want to explore. Um, you know, when Firefly first started, it was really about trying to connect with these physical computing devices, hardware like Arduino and sensors and motors. And I was always just kind of curious about those things. Um, And I wanted to explore it more. And so I just started to develop the tools for myself. Uh, And then I, you put it out there in the hopes that maybe somebody else finds it interesting, but there's always a chance that no one else will find it very interesting, but uh, really, that's not the key here. For me, it's it's really a question about uh, exploring a problem uh, and something that you know I'm very curious about, uh, and then trying to develop that a little bit further to gain a little bit more knowledge about the the problem and try to find a solution. Interesting, Mike. Yeah, uh, I mean, for me, this was like people like your other guests here uh, who were doing it much before I was. Um, so that was like a big inspiration. And then um, just using Grasshopper like for so long, kind of, I think when you're using it so long for every day, you kind of get to that point naturally uh, where you want to kind of go further. Um, 
for me, it was also personal. And then like, I'm very much into the, like, the aesthetics that are attached to like the idea of computational design. Um, and and uh, so I wanted to kind of make those simpler to achieve, you know, things like uh, gradients of things, scales and rotations and transformations and these kind of things. Um, a lot of things I was doing um, often, um, but I got tired of like wiring the same things together over and over and over. And uh, also forced me to, uh, as a project to force me to learn C Sharp um, because I, I tried a few times in the past, just like with tutorials and I always kind of just like left it or got like kind of bored. Or, but once you have like a project, uh, it's a lot easier to like stick to it and commit. And, Interesting. I hear a lot about, first of all, this is a problem that I had. So I started with this, but then it ended up in this plugin that like thousands and thousands of people in the world are using. That seems to me like, like a really big leap. So how does the decision of this is a problem that I have that I want to solve for myself, how does that turn into this is a problem that I want to solve for the rest of humanity? <laughs> because it's not trivial. That's one thing. And also as someone who has developed one of the least popular plugins in Grasshopper, <laughs> myself, <laughs> the idea of, of there's a really big jump in effort in making something that is for yourself and that you know how it works, etc. But then bundling it in a model that is understandable and usable by third party people, a concept that I will get back in a second. What motivates you to put all this effort and all this emphasis and all this work? for free, you know, which, and also work that could be seen as, hey, this was your IP, this made you powerful and valuable. You're giving that away for free for everyone, you know, you're losing your competitive edge, if you will. How does that happen? I, I mean, if I can start a little bit, I, I think, you know, for me, I started operating that way in the grasshopper community, sort of giving things away for free because that was how the grasshopper community worked. That was already the sort of the way that people operated there. People were sharing scripts. I learned grasshopper by downloading what other people did. I learned to write plugins by looking at what other people built. And so it just felt, it wasn't even a question. It wasn't like, oh, should I hold on to this thing? It was just like, oh yeah, of course I would put that out there because that's what we do. And I guess in hindsight too, it's been, you know, it's been incredibly important to the trajectory of my career to have, you know, sort of people, people I run into in the, in, in the incredibly narrow space, which is like architecture technology, like know me from my plugins. And that's led directly to job opportunities. You know, I wouldn't be a full-time software engineer right now if I hadn't made that first move to like release a plugin when I was, you know, just starting out. Interesting. So the value is not the object itself, but it's like what comes with that contribution. Yeah, I could echo that a little bit. I, I completely agree is that, um, you know, there's always short-term versus long-term views of, uh, of what you see the gain uh, of releasing something, right? Um, I think you could take a very narrow view of saying, yes, we're putting all, I'm putting all this work in and I'm not really getting paid for it and blah, blah, blah. But the longer term, if you take a longer term perspective, you know, Raja and I both sort of published the first Grasshopper Primer, which was which was made available for free, which was also a bunch of work. Uh, but obviously, we both sort of talked at the beginning, and we both realized that um, you know, if you take a longer term perspective of this, this obviously will have a pretty profound effect on the community as a whole. Instead of just sort of you know charging per download or something like that, it's not about that. It's really about trying to foster community and and uh, you know. Um, the other take I sort of have on it is that, you know, if you don't do it, somebody else will. <laughs> if you don't give it away for free necessarily, somebody else will probably make something that's equal to what you're doing and will give it away for free. And then so you might as well just sort of take this as a, as a learning opportunity uh, as well um, and sort of, you know, promote your brand or, you know, whatever you want to take, whatever your view is on it. But I like to take a longer term perspective on some of these things. <laughs> yeah, and, and probably I come to it uh, from a different perspective, but uh, to me, there is the personal growth side of things. 
you might sit with yourself and think you have the most brilliant idea. But I've been in this business long enough to know, to be humbled, really, um, that even my most brilliant idea, once I put it out with people to they use it and um, test it, I realize how much is lacking, how much growth I needed to do uh, to be able to make anything useful. So sitting with one's IP or ideas, no matter how brilliant they are, it's, it has no growth whatsoever. And I think growth is key here to contribute in, at, at any level. And I just want to address quickly another side of your question is the difference between solving your own problem and solving problem for the masses or for the general user. And this is another thing. I, it was a hard lesson for me to learn. I, uh, when you first start writing any function or any automation, uh, you have a specific purpose in mind and you can solve it very efficiently for that specific application. But once you want to share it with others, you will realize there is a hundred different ways to, to achieve the same thing and people use it differently. So it's a whole shift of mindset if you're writing for yourself as opposed to writing for others in terms of plugins or functionality and uh, what have you. So it's, a, it's an important consideration uh, before you know, starting or, or while you are sharing and getting feedback, you realize how, my, how many gaps you need to fill before it's useful. So yeah, I, this, is, this is very important, yeah. I resonate tremendously with your previous comment about personal growth, because for me, teaching is a lot of how I get that personal growth as well. The idea that I need to know something well enough to be able to distill it in a way that is understandable for other people. It's, a, it's also a big jump in, can I use this thing? Whereas, can I explain this thing? It's two totally different games, but for if me, but please, please, Mike. Oh yeah, no, for me, I mean, it just like um, you know the, the the community building. I think is is big. Like community building, definitely like the the opportunities before and after. Or it's not like there is more opportunities, but they're like different opportunities. I'd say, like even like Andrew was saying, like his job is probably completely different than. He thought it would be when he was I don't know, in architecture school or something like, that. So, like the traject you get like a lot of more trajectories kind of and ones you didn't really expect i think um so that's that's cool like and the, like you were saying like the community stuff like people kind of like know you for that thing um, i also think like when you start charging money for things you become somehow obligated uh, to be perfect and on time and on schedule and a bit less experimental. Um, mm -hmm. People don't really want to pay money for things that are kind of working. Um, and I think that's where we maybe have a lot more fun is on things that are kind of working. Uh, so that I think that's also a big factor for me is kind of like, it's a, just a different thing you have to think about when you're charging someone money versus not charging money. Uh, even like most softwares, like they have like the real tools and then they have like the, the whip tools, right? Because like to kind of, because if you don't call it whip, then people will complain about that, right? So um, it's, almost then, as, you know. <laughs> it's almost as if you're advocating for sloppy code. <laughs> no, but you know Absolutely what I mean? Joking. Like, <laughs> totally like, joking. You know, like it, it's, it's a bit like you can be a bit more free in like what you're doing and, and putting out there and and even more responsive to like updates and, and feedback and, and, and this kind of things I think is pretty it's pretty important like you know how people are using it so like and then you said like so if I make something for myself it can be very specific for instance maybe it only works on like a curve or a very specific kind of curve but then if you want to give that tool to someone else you know maybe they want to use it on surfaces and meshes and polylines and curves. And so it's like, you have to think about all these other conditions that you might not have been thinking about when you, you know, for the reason you made the, the tool specifically. But, but there has to be a certain level of commitment, I think, for any plugin to be successful because, um, you know, at the end of the day, the most successful plugins were the ones that 
people who authored them stayed with them, maintained them, updated them over the years, um, you know, try to address the feedback and take it seriously and work with the users. Um, you know, just being very uncommittal, completely experimental, you can write something, can put it out there. And there is a, a huge pile, perhaps thousands of experiments out there. It will be like uh, maybe used, maybe picked, maybe forgotten very quickly. So um, there is a certain level of commitment that comes with if you want to create or believe in, 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 in a course uh, where you think your tools or you're adding value, you gotta kind of stay with it at some level, um, regardless of whether it's uh, it's you yeah. know free or not. I think well, that's your community. I mean, that's just your community building, right? Like, how important is that to like very quickly your your community to be like you know forget this developer, we're going on to the next thing, you know, like or you know, so that that's definitely an important part of that. Is like kind of being active and responsive. <laughs> <laughs> and balance it with your personal life too. <laughs> um, yeah. Can we go back, uh, if we may, because when we were talking about how do we think about tools for other people, et cetera, et cetera, we were using the word user a lot. And I'm a big fan of Olia Lialina, who's like this early internet art activist, whatever. And she has this manifesto about calling users users and when you do that it's kind of almost you depersonalize them whereas if you call them people all of a sudden they become human and it's it's kind of a different you know so to me it relates to the idea of of how do we think of other people how do we think about how other people think and therefore how do we change what we make for ourselves versus what we make for other people? What are the assumptions that we throw on users or other people? What has your experience been? How do you think of other people? And therefore, how do you cater your code and your tools for someone that is not yourself? How does that mind shift happen in your particular case? To me, it's a really difficult thing, personally. It's definitely difficult. Um, uh if we're speaking this strictly like grasshopper, like a, a big thing for me um, that I always find myself like going through three, four or five, whatever times is that like things are consistent. Like if you call something a force here, it should be a force everywhere. Like, so people expect like what, what things are doing or what they're called. Like you wouldn't want to call on one component, something uh, a factor and then another call it a, value and then call it a number like so like just things like that i think makes it easy. and then like another thing i do a lot which is maybe a bit like ocd i don't know it's like i'm always trying to like make the um the, the inputs as same as possible in order even though not every component has the same input, but as same as possible you know so like if factors uh, the top then it should kind of be at the top but like just so people expect where things should be you know there's the the clean tree uh i, mean, I was gonna say it right now which where the input is all the way at the bottom it, it literally i've been using grasshopper for like 10 years and every single time i put it in the wrong input almost every single time or and or, like or certain components <laughs> that you take planes and certain components that take frames right yeah yeah exactly like is it a plane is it a frame is it a, you know like these kind of things i think like the consistency is definitely what makes it easier on people and the, the language you're using to like describe things in inputs uh, descriptions outputs um, you know just just to kind of all that kind of stuff i think is a huge step but it also takes a lot of time um, and redoing and redoing and redoing um, it's like for me, like 50% 50, 50 of the time is like making descriptions consistent and making icons. I mean, it's not even mostly like code, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. It, making <laughs> things for the public has so much overhead beyond the actual code. And documentation, example files are really critical to this thing. I mean, I, I think, Jose Luis, you've hit on 
one of the core questions of software building period, like forget about grasshopper components for a moment, but this is a, a problem we wrestle with every single day, you know, building software for the public. I think when you build a tool for yourself, it's really well suited to your way of conceptualizing that problem. It, it, it has an embedded opinion about the sort of like concepts at play for a given problem that you're trying to solve. And sometimes if you're lucky, when you build a thing for yourself, you happen to have hit upon a kind of a common representation or conceptual vocabulary that resonates with people. But I've also had the other experience, which is building tools, especially for people in other kinds of roles um, or with maybe more or less like technical capabilities where those conceptual vocabularies don't align at all. Um, and to me, the only tool that has ever been effective for me at getting past that is watching people use your tools, put them, like get them in front of people as soon as possible. Don't wait until you have a final polished product that you can say, ta-da, here it is. It works exactly right. Instead, prototype try stuff, put it in front of people, and most importantly, like observe them interacting with it. Like see where they thought the input should have been. And then maybe the input should go there because maybe their intuition about it is something that's going to be common among the kinds of users you're trying to address. I once conducted a formal user study for my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation. It was probably one of the most painful things I've done in my life. Because I had to sit it there hurts. silently to not interfere with the subject of the experiment, you know, and I could see them fail using my stuff. And I was like, mm. it's not like that. It's the other way. But to your point exactly, if the, if the person wants to use it that way, it probably feels like it should be used that way, not how I thought about this, this problem, you know. It was very, very painful and humbling at the same time. <laughs> Self-discovery, I mean, you're, you're also talking a little bit about self-discovery and user uh, interface design and user interaction. Uh, all of that stuff is, is incredibly difficult. That's why, you know, there's entire disciplines in school dedicated towards it. So, and a lot of times that's not what we, <laughs> we're coming from, uh, <laughs> that uh, background. And so we're learning uh, on the fly, I think. And a lot of times we don't necessarily uh, do things correctly. And so that feedback is really useful, um, I think, uh, as a designer. Um, and I think also to echo Andrew's point about documentation, um, you know, icon design, there is a lot of stuff that goes on uh, that when you do it for yourself, you know, you don't even need an icon necessarily. You can just let it hang out there. And I'm sure Michael really struggled if he has 300 components developing 300 different icons. Um, that look consistent. You know, I, but I, you're exactly. And so then you've got to come up and that's where the designer, that's some, that's fun too, but you know, making pixel perfect icons at 24 by 24 that are readable. Uh, that also, you know, I worked on Lunchbox ML, which was machine learning, which there's a number of different, um, components there that mean nothing graphically. Uh, and so trying to convey those <laughs> ideas in a 24 by 24 pixels uh, icon is incredibly difficult. So, you know, hats off, you know, I think David deserves a tremendous amount of credit for his core icon design in general, um, because they are really readable and they are really legible. Um, and so, you know, when, at least mention that he, he deserved a lot of credit for that as well. Let's, no. um, I totally agree with that. And let's take like 10 seconds to publicly acknowledge David's work and, con and congratulate him and thank him for this. Because <laughs> if it wasn't for him, we would probably not be having this conversation and we would probably not be having the possibility of contribute all this knowledge, all this technology and all this potential creativity for the community. His work is really remarkable. Yeah, right. It was in what it was in one of David's old blogs. He was saying something like that the the icon actually like some something like the icon's not really important to the function, like as long as it's something you identify with, like over time you identify it with the thing. But is that why the bake is it an egg? <laughs> is it fresh? Egg? <laughs> I don't know why. I just remember reading that. I don't know why that that like sentence like stuck stuck out to me for some reason, and I. I always kind of remember that was because his icons do represent the function. So, but it is something that he said that doesn't really necessarily have to. <laughs> well, there was a long discussion about the bacon there. <laughs> <laughs> kind of very, very famous. But I guess just to circle back, I think there are three levels of making something useful for others. Um, is 
first, you are actually solving real problem with what you are proposing. So this is like number one. The other thing is communicate it to be able to design it with a style, with uh, intuitive to use, easy. And, uh, and the third part is how to help users or the people to kind of learn it. So all these documentation, icons, style, order, um, you know, putting it in front of users, making as little assumptions as possible, uh, solving it for one person. And then by the time you solve it for the third person, you pretty much have covered everyone, everyone else. So you slowly kind of take it to the, from one person to the next, to the next, and you'll find it's a, it's, it becomes a general use uh, plugin. So all these things, but at the core of it, you are really solving real problem with the minimum amount of, with the minimum set of components or the minimum set of functions, because once you exceed certain number, you really lose, uh, you know, people attention and the ability to, to, to grasp how to use it. So complexity is not necessarily to your advantage, always less is more, uh, if you can get away with it, obviously. So more doesn't necessarily mean it's, it could be more confusing. So there is that kind of balance that you have to, to make. And it's, uh, it, you know, it takes with time, with experiment, with putting people in front of what you create, really. I think you hit on a topic there too, Raja, about, you know, simplifying things though, in that it does bring up this, um, idea of bias that I think uh, Andrew talked about a little bit as well is that you start to make assumptions, right? If you if you try to simplify things too much, you start to make assumptions about how the user is going to work with the, the component. And so there's a trade-off a little bit of like how much complexity do you add where you can adjust every hundred different settings for every different algorithm and vice versa, or do you make assumptions and say, this is the set that we're going to allow and, and so that's a tricky, tricky problem to kind of crack. And I guess that's where you get feedback from your users, obviously. But, um, you know, that's and, and maybe that's also where you start to introduce different UI techniques of like embedding menus and vice versa. But, you know, I think that's an interesting problem to try to crack as a developer. Mm -hmm. I think the, the like on, on that kind of note, like a big one I can think of is that, uh, Grasshopper doesn't really let you control tolerance. And it seems like a lot of people want to control tolerance. Like if you look through the forms, everyone's always like, like a big issue is always tolerance. How can I change tolerance, tolerance, tolerance? Like, and you know, obviously you change it in, in Rhino and then it changes in Grasshopper, but it's not so obvious, I guess, for, you know, for new users that that's the kind of connection there. Um, so things like that too. It's like, yeah, like, like, what are we assuming, or what are we just giving to them, uh, or not telling them how to control, or is it even important to control these kind of questions? I I hear this is super interesting. Perhaps this is this is perhaps the most difficult question I'm going to throw at you, perhaps, because I hear a lot about trying to find what are the measures. So what are the metrics to, to understand if we are being successful at helping other people with our tools, right? And I, particularly with my work and perhaps the spirit that I want to convey also in, in this channel is that all of these technical nightmares are okay because at the end of the day, what we want is um, something that is design, something that is creativity, something that is, the technicals is fine, but Ultimately, what we want is to empower people, to make them more creative, more fluent, more expressive, all those shades. So, but how do we measure that? How do we know if we're actually helping someone be more creative, someone expand their design capabilities, someone to make someone express what they want to express in a more, is it about easy? Is it about fluency? Is it about promoting iteration? Is it about quick? results, flashy, how, how does this, how do you think about this problem? If you think, if you if your goal is to promote creativity, let's say. Yeah, I, I think 
I don't necessarily try to think that I'm going to improve their design capabilities, but to kind of give them a, a set of things and kind of you know, that I didn't have before and see what they do with it. I mean, that's kind of the idea. I don't really know what people are, and then half, I mean, more than half, like 90% of the stuff I see people do with, with stuff I make, I, I didn't even think they'll, they'll do that or not even what I would have done. Or um, I'm, I'm honestly surprised at what people use it for, to, to be honest, like just compared to like, you know, the, the stuff I was using it for. So um, that's always really interesting to me. Uh, so yeah, I, like I, I think to me, it's more of a surprise. I, didn't, I really don't expect a lot of the stuff that people do with, with my tools. <laughs> Oh, they are used. I can tell you that much. But I mean, this is specifically a question I've been occupied by for a very long time, maybe from, from the very beginning. And you really hit my motivation to become a software developer for designers to start with. I have background in architecture, right? And, and I switched to building tools. Uh, because I didn't think the tools that were available in the late 1990s were serving any creative um, purpose uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with architects or with designers in general. So, I mean, the idea of uh, providing digital platform that helps people be creative in their design and express their design was my obsession, basically. And I think the main way, the main measure that I have used over the years is how I can minimize the, um, the gap between synthesis and reflection. So you put together your idea and be able to see it and reflect on it. <laughs> the more in real time it is, the more successful it is. This is perhaps why Grasshopper is immensely successful, is that you synthesize and see the result almost instantaneously, right? And so there is no gap between writing a code or scripting, which what Grasshopper is used for, and seeing the result of your script. I, I you know, the, the, the smaller the gap between synthesizing or reflecting on your problem or design, the more creative you can be uh, as a designer. And that has always been the measure, right? Like, uh, with paneling tools, I started as a plugin for, for, for Rhino as well. All I was doing is basically trying to make it extremely efficient and fast to generate the patterns, edit them, update them, preview them, and then be able to then design with them, be creative with them. If there is any gap, you cannot be creative at all, just specifically about creativity. Um, so. That's a great point, Raja. Um... Yeah, I was trying to think of like how you measure success and it's an incredibly difficult problem uh, or uh, term to try to define. But um, I think the idea of being able to, you know, to quickly iterate uh, on, a, on an idea and be able to visualize that in real time or near real time. I think for me, for Firefly, it was about developing these ways to connect the real world with a three-dimensional environment, which was kind of a really compelling idea at the time. I'm sure there's better tools or more tools now, uh, but in 2009, really, you know, you had the Arduino IDE, which is strictly, you know, code. And then there was processing, which was two-dimensional graphics that you could generate, but there was no way to tie in a three-dimensional uh, environment with these hardware devices like a sensor. And so for me, what became really powerful as an idea of interactive prototyping, if you will, is this idea of building something that you could then visualize in three dimensions, but use real world parameters like a light sensor driving a louver system, or you know, then have you know that information come back out and drive a motor that is controlling your louver system. So it's this idea to be able to iterate or prototype. Uh, a design uh, more quickly, and that could either be just a digital form like regular grasshopper barometric design, but also with Firefly, it became about this idea of prototyping physically as well. So how can we make that process uh, happen more organically and also more fluid? Um, and so uh, that was a big 
uh, driving force for, for my development and also try to make that uh, increase um, over time. So I hear surprise, I hear fluency, I hear quick iteration, the, la the lack of friction between the tools that we use to produce something and the tools we use to reflect on that something. Very interesting. I will say I was, I, you know, when I was making Pufferfish, I mean, it seems like a lot of components, but I think I'm trying to deconstruct it enough so that it's not imposing a bias, a specific output. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, I, I don't want the tools to only do like kind of one thing and then like that's kind of like the output of the thing because i mean that's definitely necessary in some plugins and some tools but i just for like what i was trying to do it, it wasn't like i just didn't want like one specific type of thing to be which yeah. is which is super interesting because i think that's a cultural thing i think that's an ethos that we had years ago the idea of like the sandbox environment let me give you as atomized uh, processes as possible so that you have all these building blocks to perform your own Lego composition. Whereas I, I am under the perception that in more modern times, the app culture is totally going the other way around and it wants to be as biased as possible. Is this one app, it creates these results, you only have to press twice here and then you get like this super flashy, like, I don't know, like this AI image that was generated from some text or something that is extremely, extremely biased and is a lot of bang for your buck, but no customization, no. It's two different cultures. I don't know, maybe it's, it's the old mm, cranky man speaking now, <laughs> like all these I youngsters think, and, the, maybe, and their apps. I think they're you know? both necessary. It just depends with like what you want to do. Yeah. yeah, and I think about it in terms of, like, because I think it's it's unavoidable. There is no tool that doesn't impart a bias of some kind even you know the kinds of things you can draw with charcoal versus with a you know a micron pen are sort of different in character um, and that's true for all tools and it's especially true for software tools um, and i think that has to do also with sort of like a level of abstraction and granularity that's addressed by the tool i think grasshopper is really amazing because it operates at kind of like a it's, a, I guess, a higher level of abstraction than modeling in Rhino in that instead of saying model this box, then model this box, it's like model a system of boxes. Um, but it's also not going up the next level of abstraction, which is like, here's a one button approach to generate your system of boxes. So I, there's always these trade offs between the level of intelligence embedded in a system. It's how opinionated it is, what level of abstraction it's addressing. And it, and it really does operate as a spectrum. And there's enormous value in highly opinionated, highly intelligent tools. And there's also a lot of value in low level, granular, you know, low level of abstraction tools that just let you do whatever you want. And I think, you know, the, the measure to get back to sort of the, the earlier question for me has always been about, again, what, what Mike brought up about surprise, like, is that, does it have sufficient flexibility and granularity that things can emerge from it that I didn't expect. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that's really important in the landscape of creative tools specifically. Like if all you could, you know, I think about like early Instagram filters, if all they do is make all the photos like look like this one old Polaroid, it like, it becomes boring and stupid really fast. <laughs> um, but now they have all these editing tools built in and you can actually sort of have your own style and stylistic intention embedded in how you wield this tool as a creative medium. And we end up with a global architectural style parametric system, yeah. right? <laughs> no, I know, funny about you know the Instagram filters. I, I think I feel like you know, on that conversation, and, but then there's like the tech side too, right? Like as the phone cameras get better, I feel like people are there's more filters, and I think people are using them less because the cameras are so good now. I know it's kind of kind of like a weird. That's interesting. You, you might be right, yeah. Hardware versus software uh, kind of flip there. <laughs> yep. But how much filtering is happening on the camera side? I mean, <laughs> there's actually doing a lot of stuff in the background that they don't show us that we don't have control over. Well, that's the thing, yeah. like, with the, you know, with systems that are, like, having a lot of bias, like, I guess then you have the question of, like, 
do you trust the solution? Or like, like, how do you know that you trust the solution? Yeah, All right. Kind of, yeah, yeah. We're running a little, we're going to run out of time very soon. I want to ask <laughs> you the last question. So sure. for folks who are watching this video who just learned how to code in an advanced way into perhaps their first steps in creating a Grasshopper plugin, what would you recommend for those folks who might be thinking of starting their own project? And maybe this may not be exactly a Grasshopper plugin. This might be any piece of code or any tool that they're thinking of contributing out in the wild. What would you recommend for people who are thinking to em engage in this project? I would say go for it. Don't wait. Just go for it. Throw it out there. But don't be too attached. Don't have very high expectation. Your first and second and tenth will be will not work as you expected, and you should level your expectation. Um, grow as fast as you can. Engage people. Uh, there is a lot of energy in the community in the making, and it's it's an incredibly rewarding process and rewarding um, uh, you know sphere to be part of. So just go for it. Hell yeah. I would agree. Uh, I would say start today. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think it's also important to be passionate about the problem that you're trying to tackle. Uh, that could be just you're passionately annoyed at a problem that you're facing at work, uh, or you know, you have a, a really curious idea about you know uh, some project. But I think it really takes a, a curiosity, a level of uh, dedication to say, I really want to. Um, solve this problem because you're inevitably going to come across pitfalls. Uh, you're going to struggle, I think, with some problems that you don't really know how to solve. Uh, there's amazing resources like Jose's camp. Uh, there's, um, you know, there's uh, online forums. There's a lot of places you can go online to find help. But I would say don't give up on those problems. Uh, that's where you learn. That's where you begin to this journey uh, uh, of personal exploration as you develop this idea, uh, you know, I think that for me and probably for most of the people here, that's the sort of um, uh, brain uh, chemical uh, that gets uh, released when you do something uh, good is that aha moment where you solve the problem and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I need some more. Um, and so, you know, it's the struggle through those problems and the, the exploration through it and finding the solution is what really makes it, you know, a fun problem to solve. I totally this, relate to that uh, chemical thing you just say, like, oh, this was so satisfying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, the, you know, for me, it's uh, also to not feel like you have to kind of reinvent the wheel. I mean, there's a lot of resources and talented people uh, out there and you know like I I remember actually like one one example I, I did these plain things and then Andrew tried it and he wanted like these quaternions and you know I'm not like a quaternion mathematician um, but I saw that like Daniel Piker had solved it in some way um, but then I wrote so then I, I wrote to Daniel I was like hey do you mind if I like check out your code and like change it a bit for this specific thing because I mean, obviously I was not trying to take his component, which was specific for that. I was trying to just use a piece of, of the code in a way to do something else. Um, so that's also another thing too, like if you're gonna do that, it's it's good to ask people like, you know, to use their stuff <laughs> um, if you want, if you, if you need it. Um, and then also I think, yeah, so I, I, like, re, you know, rely on like the community and like what's out there, you know, ask people for, Permission is <laughs> always always a good thing to do. It's a very um, good thing, very important. Mm -hmm. um, if you, yeah, I mean, can't hurt to ask, uh, and uh, yeah, and and just don't don't uh, yeah, just just uh, don't think that you have to kind of start from from nothing because there's there's so much there's there's really really so 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 much information out there. And lastly, is I think just try to take like your own unique spin on things too right like like i mentioned with like daniel it's like you don't want to like say hey can i take your thing and then just like remake the thing right like i just needed it for a small part of like a bigger thing i was doing right so it's, it's also awesome 
Yeah, I mean, I think I would echo what what Mike said and just, you know, I often think about it in terms of like write, uh, reading is as, as important as writing, like getting out there in the world and like looking at open source projects when, when, you know, when I think a lot of us started out writing Grasshopper plugins, there actually weren't very many open source Grasshopper plugins that were out in the world. Now there's a lot and you can learn a lot from the way other people structure their plugins. And I think that's true even just for Grasshopper scripts or any kind of coding, like just like see how other people approach the problem and, and even copying it exactly, not necessarily to publish, but just to understand like line by line, try and understand how someone is structuring something and you will learn. I mean, that is how, how I learned to write code period, not just, you know, not just Grasshopper plugins, but like I learned to code by like looking at how other people solved a particular problem or built a particular feature on a Grasshopper plugin. The one other thing I would say, which is a little like low level technical is get really good at debugging. Tools like Visual Studio's edit and continue debugger is really critical. So you can like make changes on the fly. And it's, it's exactly what Raja was saying earlier about the kind of like time to seeing the effect of the change that you make. She had a more elegant way of putting it, but this sort of cycle of, you know, action and the impact that that action has, it's really important to be able to do that. And every code tool out there has some facility for this sort of, you know, debugging, you know, whether it's print statements or whatever else, just so you can really see what you're doing and understand what's happening. That is extremely important. We had a, a couple of videos on that topic in the playlist. Awesome. It is, it is. I think when, when, when we started uh, Grasshopper, what was like, I, when I started, there was like, in terms of, except for just Grasshopper, there was like paddling tools, we were very, and <laughs> a kangaroo and maybe Firefly was just, came out, I don't, I don't know, something like... Lunchbox, I think, was one of the first. Yeah, like, like just came yeah. out, like... <laughs> Yeah, there's a, so much stuff and information out now to yeah. take advantage of. 10 years in computational time is a long time. Yeah, the community has evolved and matured a lot. It's great. All right, before we wrap up, I have two small, very small surveys that I want to throw at you. The community here at Paramagican is very divided in two part, very particular topics. First of all, are you folks Grasshopper icons people or Grasshopper text people on the component? Icon. Icon, my text. text. Andrew. Icon. Oh, yeah, text. Right. I, I, use the icon. I use the icon, but I teach with the text. Wow. So we are very divided in this forum as well. Oh, boy. <laughs> OK. No one's perfect. And OK. And the other one, this is really, really important. C sharp or Python? C sharp. C sharp. C sharp. C sharp. Very good. That was the right answer. <laughs> I like structure. I like good structure. You like constraints, right? <laughs> yeah, it makes yeah, me feel type like safety. Yeah, I, I just feel more. I feel more safe. I think it's a show. like I, I feel like a, it's kind of like holding my hand along the way. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. All right. I cannot express my gratitude for all of you folks being here today and sharing your thoughts with the community. Andrew, Raja, Andy, Mike, thank you so much for being here on behalf of myself and on behalf of the community. Um, and we will see you in some other video or in some other occasion. And keep up with the really good work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Thanks for having us. All right. And I think at this point, it would be when we would stop the video. Uh, OK, all right. So I think that would probably be the end of the actual video. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the live stream for a second. And I'm going to go back to Zoom and to say goodbye to you, et cetera, et cetera. And then I will go back to the live stream and wrap up with the audience that we have here. OK? So everyone who's so on the live stream. So you want to sign off after? When do you want us to sign off? Like uh, let's, let's go back to Zoom. Just stay, stay, stay on. Just give me a second. So everyone who's on the live stream, I'll be back in one minute. So just give me one minute to say goodbye to the folks. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Zed. That was Thank really you. lovely. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's, interesting, what's interesting is that we all kind of have, I think, the similar ideas, or similar answers. So I don't know if there's something there, something about that. <laughs> So, okay, like, so like right now, <laughs> Mike. All right, my hand is uh, just disappearing there. <laughs> all right, all right, yeah. take care. Bye, Thanks, bye. All. bye. bye. All right, beautiful. I'm back. So, um uh, that was so interesting and so cool, right? Um, I saw that there were a few questions on the chat, but unfortunately we had a hard stop at noon, so we couldn't really extend the conversation any farther. But um, but that was so cool. What do you guys, what do you guys think? Uh, let me actually read through the comments. I'm say, what do you think about the conversation or about the opinions and about some kind of there was some kind of consensus, some kind of interesting quorum and common ideas that were shared. I found it really, really interesting. And thank you everyone for the congratulations on the 100th live stream. So I want to make this super clear. If it wasn't for the community and if it wasn't for the beautiful people that I get to meet every week, and that join me in making this happen and that give me company and give me suggestions real time, etc. etc. If it wasn't for that, I would be extremely bored and extremely pointless and empty. So and I would definitely not be doing this. So this is not only my 100th live stream, it's all of yours 100th live stream. And I'm very happy that we can grow together and make this happen. Beautiful. All right. Uh, chemicals is a point. <laughs> All right. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, a lot of love for everyone. This is great. Okay, beautiful. So um, I'm going to actually All right, so um, I think that's going to be it for today. The, um, the edited version of this video will probably not go live until we actually record all the, um, all the tutorials that we have in between. We still have to wrap up like a few things grasshopper wise and development wise. So, but if you have, if you were not able to watch this or if you're have friends who want to watch the conversation, you can, you're, ha you're welcome to redirect them to the conversation that we had today on the live stream. And then the editing video will come out at some point. Uh, 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 humane. <laughs> yeah, people are humane. It's, it's human beings, you know. <laughs> uh, all right, beautiful. Okay. So I'm going to take off. I have stuff to do this weekend. I have to work a lot this weekend, actually. So thank you very much for being here. I'll see you next week. Are we streaming next week? We are streaming next week. Uh, I'll see you next week. We will continue recording advanced development in Grasshopper videos. And, um, and yeah, and thank you very much. Until then, have a good weekend yourself too. Thank you. Bye-bye.